Good afternoon, everyone, or good early evening. I'm Bill Doley, the president and CEO of Archaeology Southwest. Um, as some of you may know, that uh, status is going to change in the new year. Uh, we have a new leader in Steve uh, Nash coming in on January 15th. So it's a real honor to be up here in front of an in-person crowd at the Loft Cinema uh, as we carry forward our, our long-running tradition of, of uh, these archaeology cafe sessions. So uh, all of you brave folks in the audience there, you have plenty of uh, room to spread out. And it's really good to see, though, people in person. So thanks for coming out tonight. And Loft Cinema is about two, three miles uh, from our office here in Tucson. Uh, I want to acknowledge that we're uh, present on the land of the Tana Atum and the Pasquayaki. And for those of you in our remote audience, welcome to the event tonight. But reflect on the lands where you are tonight and their original uh, people who are the, the landowners in that place. We're primarily based here in Tucson. Most of our staff are here in Tucson. We have staff up in Phoenix now and uh, Paul Reed over in the state of New Mexico. So we've grown substantially over time. And the ways in which we implement uh, preservation archaeology have changed. But a, a stable part of this has been these archaeology cafes. And the theme uh, that we've carried out th throughout this year Nourishing Body and Soul and Earth, Traditional Foods and Foodways. And tonight I'm honored to introduce to you Ashley Thompson. In the big lights up here on the screen, Director of Tribal Collaboration and Research, in Research and Education for Archaeology Southwest. And she'll be presenting on something that's very personal to her, uh, more than subsistence, how Anishinaabe traditional foodways nourish culture, kinship, and community well-being. Ashley, I'm honored to uh, have you here tonight, and the stage is now yours. Thank you, Bill. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming out to hear me speak. I'm really honored that you took time out of your evening to be with us tonight. Um, as Bill said, I am Ashley Thompson. I am Director of Tribal Collaboration at Archaeology Southwest, where I've been working for about two years now. Um, I am also a member of the Red Lake Ojibwe Tribe, um, and so I am Anishinaabe, and um, I will be presenting about my master's research tonight. I received my master's degree from the University of Arizona in the School of Anthropology a few years ago. Um, so let's get started. Oh, I also wanted to introduce myself in Ojibwe Moen or the Ojibwe language. So, Anin Buju, Ashley Nindijnikaz, Miskwagamwi, Zagaigan, and Dojeba, Megizi, and Dodem. I said hello, I'm Ashley. I'm a member of the Red Lake Ojibwe tribe, and I'm of the Eagle Clan. So, tonight, I thought I would start off with a traditional Anishinaabe story. So um, winter is our storytelling time, as it is for a lot of indigenous people across Turtle Island. So I do feel comfortable sharing the story with you all tonight. It's also a story that has been published by a couple Anishinaabe authors. Um, and as some of you may know, cultural knowledge and traditional stories can be very sensitive when we talk about sharing them with the public. Um, but because it is our storytelling season, because the story has been published, and because it's not reserved for ceremony, I feel okay sharing it with you tonight. A long, long time ago, the Anishinaabe people were starving. The Hooft clan relatives had left Anishinaabe Aki, and we didn't know where they had gone. Our Hooft clan relatives include the deer, the moose, um, and the caribou. And because they had left our lands, we didn't have enough to eat. So Anishinaabe leaders came together to try to figure out what to do about this problem. They decided that they needed to send runners in the four directions to try to figure out 
where our hoofed clan relatives had gone. So we sent runners to the east, a runner to the south, a runner to the west, and a runner to the north. And we waited, and we waited, and we waited. Runners from the east, the south, and the west returned empty-handed. They had not found our hoofed clan relatives in those directions. But finally, the runner from the north did find our hoofed clan relatives, way, way far north, being guarded by crows. The runner had tried to convince the hoofed clan relatives to return to Anishinaabe Aki, but they refused. So our leaders got together again to try to decide what to do. They decided that they needed to send our wisest elders to try to convince our hoofed clan relatives to return. So a group of Anishinaabe elders headed north to find them and try to convince them. When they arrived, um, they were really happy and grateful to see them. They had not seen them for a long time. And they asked, why did you leave Anishinaabe Aki or Anishinaabe land? The Hooft clan relatives shared that they had felt very disrespected by the Anishinaabe. They were disrespected because one, the Anishinaabe people had stopped doing their cultural ceremonial protocol when hunting. So for us, we put out a sema or tobacco before hunting, before taking anything from the land. So the Anishinaabe people had stopped doing that. And so because of that, the Hooft clan relatives felt very disrespected. They also shared with the Anishinaabe leaders that the Anishinaabe people had become greedy. So when they had taken a deer, for example, they'd kept all of the deer meat to themselves and did not share it with the wider community. So they felt disrespected. The last piece of criticism that they gave the Anishinaabe people was that the Anishinaabe had become wasteful. And our traditional values, we're supposed to use every part of anything we take, and the Anishinaabe people had strayed away from that ethic. So because of all of these reasons, the Hooft clan relatives felt very disrespected and they had left. The elders gathered among themselves and talked about this problem. And they acknowledged that the Anishinaabe people had stopped doing these things, these things that um, were really important to maintaining relations with our hoofed clan relatives. So they entered into a treaty of sorts with our hoofed clan relatives. And they promised that the Anishinaabe people would continue to do the proper ceremonies when taking a life that they would share um, the meat with the wider community, and that they would not be wasteful and use every part. So the Hooft clan relatives agreed to come home, and they are there today in the Great Lakes region. So I want you all to just take a moment to reflect on that story and think about what kind of values or ethics are apparent from that Hooft clan story. And I'll give you all a moment. Um, usually if you know, I was teaching a class or something, I would have you guys answer. But I'll just let you sit quietly and think for a second while I have some tea. So one of the values you may have noticed is that Anishinaabe people, we are ceremonial people. Um, it's spirit, uh, our spirituality is um, supposed to be uh, practiced within every aspect of our life. So um, the act of putting out a sema or tobacco is really important for the Anishinaabe people and maintaining our relationships with um, more than human beings. Another value is that we are supposed to be generous. Um, we're not supposed to think with the individual centered, but to think of our community and the well-being of everyone, the Hooft clan relatives included. Uh, as we live our lives. Another value is we're not supposed to be wasteful. We're supposed to use every part um, and show gratitude. And then lastly, you might have noticed that I referred to them as our relatives. In an Anishinaabe worldview, um, more than human beings are considered our kin. 
there's a saying in Anishinaabe that we are all related. And that's actually a pretty common saying across Native country. And because we're all related, we need to be in respectful, reciprocal relationships with everyone we encounter. So I used that story and those values that I just explained to form the theoretical framework for my research project. And so today I want to get into that research project with you. I'll go into an in-depth introduction about me and my family and how I came to this research. I will explain a bit about Miskwagamu Izaga Igan and Donje Ba, which is Red Lake Ojibwe Nation. I'll discuss some of the methods of my food sovereignty project, and then I will share some of the teachings that I learned uh, by conducting this research. So I wanted to share this chart with you all. Um, I know it's probably difficult to read, but it's showing how historical or intergenerational trauma is passed on. Um, so this has been studied by a lot of researchers as a concept. And essentially, communities um, that have faced discrimination, disempowerment, often experience historical trauma. So American Indian communities, um, the African American community, they, they experience these, these traumas. It results in a loss of collective identity um, as indigenous people, for example. Um, for in the boarding school at the community level, our communities lost a whole generation and more than one generation of children actually. So this led at the community level to community disorganization, um, social problems and conflict. At the family level, families were deeply impacted by uh, boarding schools and other traumas perpetuated on them. And so that resulted in um, grief, anger, family dysfunction, domestic violence, and abuse. And of course, um, families deeply impact the individual, so that was passed on to individuals who experience low self-esteem, mental health problems, difficulty parenting, etc. Luckily, um, in my eyes, I see my generation and the current generation as breaking the cycle of trauma. Um, and so I feel very lucky that I um, attended Morris and majored in American Indian studies and learned about stuff like this because it was able, or I was able to understand um, how history impacts generations today and how it can be a really difficult cycle to break um, when there's historical and intergenerational trauma involved. So um, as someone who was removed from Minnesota and raised away from my community and my culture, I did not grow up with the language. I did not grow up with the culture. Um, and I definitely didn't grow up understanding our traditional food ways or anything about them. So um, a little bit after I'd graduated, I moved to Tucson um, and I decided that I wanted to do my master's research in collaboration with my tribe, the Red Lake Ojibwe Nation. Um, it was really important for me that my research not just get me a degree, but also be beneficial to um, the community that I was working with. So I approached our tribal historic preservation officer um, and then our tribal secretary, and they uh, were really open to working with me. Um, and so I asked them, is there any sort of research that an anthropology graduate student could do that would help out the tribe in any way. Um, they shared with me that there were a lot of uh, foodway revitalization programs going on in Red Lake. Um, and then that they thought that getting interviews with elders about our foodways and their significance to the community would be really beneficial. 
a lot of the elders that are fluent language speakers and carry the culture, a lot of them are walking on. And so by preserving um, these interviews, they thought that that could help preserve our cultural knowledge and our foodway knowledge. There's been some research on Anishinaabe foodways, especially um, wild rice or on the maple sugar uh, harvest. Um, but there hadn't been a foodways project that identified Red Lake specifically, our traditional foodways, or their significance. Um, in Tucson, I had had the opportunity to go choya bud harvesting. Um, that's what this photo is of. But again, I had not ever really gotten to know Anishinaabe traditional food. So I was really excited about this project and about um, interviewing elders for it. I want to provide some context first, however, and explain who the Anishinaabe people are. So one of my mentors explained to me that the Anishinaabe people, we first lived in the western part of North America or Turtle Island. And a long time ago, we spread out across the continent and moved to the eastern part of the continent, continent into Iroquoian territory. And then about 1,500 years ago, we were in conflict with tribes um, that are now in like the northeastern United States over uh, food shortages, actually. So our leaders um, had a prophecy, and that prophecy was that the Anishinaabe people had to move west to where food grows on water. Where food grows on water is a reference to monomen or wild rice. So we followed our leaders and started our migration into the Great Lakes region. There were seven major stopping points along the way. Um, Anishinaabe people settled into what is now Ontario and Michigan, and then others continued westward, um, settling all around this region. Today, this is a map of communities that speak um, Anishinaabe languages. So you'll notice there is a concentration around the Great Lakes region, but there's also some communities that are really far west in the United States. The farthest west Anishinaabe community is the Rocky Boy Reservation in central Montana. Um, and then the farthest south is the Potawatomi Nation. Um, and they were removed during Indian removal all the way down to Oklahoma but there's definitely a concentration um, in the Great Lakes region. In Minnesota, uh, there are seven Anishinaabe reservations and four Dakota communities. Red Lake is that community at the top of Minnesota in the center. Um, our reservation goes around Upper and Lower Red Lake, which are the largest lakes in, um, with, wholly within Minnesota. Red Lake is a really unique place. We refused allotment. So in the late 1800s, another assimilation tactic of the US federal government was to privatize reservation lands. Um, and so what they did was they broke them into allotments. And these allotments were first given to uh, native people, but any surplus land was sold. And so, on a lot of reservations today, there's private land um, within reservation boundaries. Um, and so White Earth, for example, is another Ojibwe community in Minnesota, and they have um, a lot of checkerboarding, they call it, where you have these private land plots um, within the reservation border. But Red Lake refused allotment, um, so all land within our borders is owned in common by tribal members and there is no privatization of land, which has been a blessing in many ways. It's kept out a lot of outside influence and assimilation. Um, Panema is one of four villages in Red Lake, um, and it's known as the home of the Ojibwe language because it has the highest Ojibwe language speakers um, in the country. And this is due in part to uh, you know, having a community that has been intact and 
um, not having outside influences within the reservation borders. So I wanted to also orient you guys and show you some photos I've taken around Red Lake. Um, it's a really beautiful, incredible place full of water and woods. Uh, there's amazing ecological diversity there. I've seen wolf pups, black bears are very common, loons, beavers, all sorts of critters and plant animal life as well. We have four villages um, and we have about 15,000 tribal members, half of them living on the reservation. So as I mentioned, interviewing would be an important part of my project. And I really like doing interviews. Um, I think they're in line with the indigenous oral tradition of storytelling. Um, and so the oral tradition and storytelling are really important aspects of Anishinaabe culture. Sonia Adelaide, who is an Ojibwe archaeologist, writes, in Ojibwe culture, there remains a sense that knowledge, particularly that related to our history, is shared by the community. It is not stored externally in books on shelves, but is internal, held inside the people themselves. It is passed from elders to youth via the oral tradition, through face-to-face -face interactions, and in daily life practice. Another important part of my methodology was um, collaborating with elders. Uh, so I've included the Ojibwe words for elder on the left with the translations on the right. And if you've been in native country at all, you'll know that elders hold a highly respected place in our society. Um, and it's true for the Anishinaabe people. So one of our words for elders is Gitchi Anishinaabe, which means great person. Another word for elder is Aki Winzi, or long dweller on earth. And although being called an old woman in English might be considered offensive, to be referred to as Mendemoyen in Ojibwe culture is actually a great honor to have reached that age and that status of being an elder. So through uh, research into the historical and ethnographic record, as well as through uh, conducting these interviews, I was able to identify seven major foodways of the Red Lake Ojibwe. I like to start during the Anishinaabe New Year, which is in the spring during the maple sugar harvest. So this typically occurs in March. Historically, communities dispersed in the spring to go to their respective sugar bush camps. Um, and the maple sugar harvest is still practiced today um, for culture, food, and profit by Ojibwe people. The next food way is gardening. Um, so out of all of the food ways that I discussed with the elders, gardening was covered by each individual and each had their own experience growing food growing up. Many of the elders talked about their families having very large gardens that the entire family was responsible for tending. And they recall a variety of foods being grown as they grew up, including corn, potatoes, rhubarb, squash, beans, carrots, rutabagas, cucumbers, tomatoes, and watermelon. As far as contemporary gardening, tribal members do continue this tradition, but it's not practiced to the extent that it once was. The next food way is berry picking. So different berries come out and fruit throughout the summertime. And so that's practiced throughout the summer season. Berries are an important food way uh, as part of our diets, but even as an important ceremonial food. As you can imagine, being a water rich area, fishing is another important food way for the Red Lake Ojibwe. Um, fishing is practiced year round. There's ice fishing in the winter, spear fishing in the spring, um, netting and line fishing in the summer. I made this other category wild food gathering because people did talk about harvesting mushrooms, harvesting traditional teas, wild tubers, things like that. And so those could be harvested throughout the spring, summer and fall. Uh, the photograph on the bottom left shows bags of Menomen or wild rice. And then on the, the three bags on the right are what we call swamp tea. Um, I've heard it referred to as Labrador tea too. Um, and that's a medicinal tea that can be used um, to help uh, 
conditions like congestion. And then the last category that I identified was hunting, snaring, and collecting of eggs. That was all well and good, but I was really curious about you know, why are these foodways important to our community? Why do we have all of these revitalization programs in the community that are trying to get um, the current and future generations to practice our traditional foodways once again? I found this framework that was created by the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance to be very helpful. Each of these are elements of indigenous food sovereignty. I could connect each one of these elements to Red Lake Food Sovereignty, um, but I'll just focus on a few for tonight. So I've already covered relationships with animal relatives. Um, I've already covered intergenerational knowledge transfer, um, the importance that elders play in transferring that knowledge to the future generations. Um, but I'm gonna cover these last three with arrows. So um, one of the major reasons that uh, the elders shared that our foodways are important is because they help our community have better health and well-being. And so I like this quote by David Manuel that he uses to explain what happened historically and how it's impacting the people today. He said that as colonization crept in and our lands were taken and our traditional food pathways were cut off, the government started supplementing our traditional needs with commodities, and with these commodities came diet-related health disparities. And even though it filled their bellies, it gave people diabetes and obesity and heart disease. So he's referring to colonization generally, but um, just you know, imagine that back in the day, we had all of this land where we could follow the seasonal round of food, that annual cycle, and move around um, in a pretty wide territory to follow our foods and to live our lives. After being confined to much smaller reservations, a lot of those food pathways were cut off to us because we had to stay on the reservation initially. Another interesting thing that came out of this project is that although, for example, Anishinaabe people were well known for wild rice, in Red Lake, wild rice uh, doesn't really grow in very many places. Back in the day, Anishinaabe people would actually go to places like White Earth and Leech Lake to harvest wild rice um, because there's only a few rice beds within the contiguous Red Lake Reservation today. As a result, um, as well, of um, commodity and ration programs, those introduced uh, foods that were not um, common in our diets before colonization. Um, and then, you know, also with the assimilation came a totally different lifestyle. Um, rather than being focused on getting food for the next year, um, we didn't focus on that. We got jobs and food gathering was less essential. And so, as well as, as I explained earlier, the boarding schools, those also cut off a lot of that knowledge transfer that elders used to be able to do to the younger generations because the younger generations were taken away to boarding school. Another person I spoke to was Vicki Finday. And she remembers that back in the day, elders had a really long lifespan. So she said that we seem to be decreasing the lifespan because of our way of our diets, our change of lifestyle. This is a photograph of a man. His English name was John Smith, um, but he was from Red Lake and he purportedly lived to the age of 132. So back in the day, our elders um, had very long lifespans and lived a long time. Today, however, um, the average life expectancy for American Indians is five and a half years shorter than the average American. So community members see our traditional foodways as a way to remedy um, these health issues that Anishinaabe people and the wider indigenous community are experiencing. Another element of indigenous food sovereignty is natural resources, water, and land. So a couple of the elders I interviewed talked about um, this story, and not just a story, it's something that happened <laughs> in the recent past, about 20 years ago. 
I, I showed the image earlier of the map and there's upper and lower Red Lake. One of our major tribal businesses is our tribal fisheries program. And in that program, tribal members can uh, bring their daily catch um, that they fished out of the lake to the fisheries and they'll um, receive payment. And then that fish is sold nationally actually across the United States. There's a lot of different species of fish in upper and lower Red Lake, but the highest value fish is walleye. So obviously walleye um, is a fish that tribal members are going to want to catch because it generates the most income for them. And there are people that are full-time fisher people in Red Lake. Unfortunately, um, about 20 years ago, the walleye population plummeted and crashed. So um, we had to have a ban on walleye fishing for a while. And the population did rebound, um, and it's in a healthy state currently. But David talks about this story. He said that it's OK to take advantage of these gifts in a good way, not in an exploitive way, like when we experienced the collapse of the walleye some 12 years ago or more. We took advantage of those gifts. We weren't respectful of those gifts. We have to approach the earth and the water and the air as giving. So I see a lot of similarities between this walleye story and the traditional hoofed clan story that I shared earlier. Here, the Anishinaabe people um, became greedy. Uh, they took more than they should have. And as a result, the walleye left us for a while. Um, and luckily, we were able to get that population back to a healthy number again. Um, the last element of food sovereignty I want to discuss is the importance that foodways hold in our culture and our language. Uh, Vicky shares that um, our kids now can just go to the store and get a bag of chips if they're hungry, compared to when I was growing up in the woods and picking berries, blueberries, choke cherries, raspberries. Kids do not have the process of gathering, identifying, bringing home, preparing it. A lot of today's generation are disconnected from our traditional foodways, as she points out. Um, you know, we have stores on the reservation, people can get food that way. And so unfortunately, um, these traditions of berry picking, for example, are not practiced to the extent that they once were. Our traditional foodways are viewed as a way to practice our culture. Um, a lot of the values that I shared about the Hoofed Clan story, for example, are passed on um, in these cultural traditions of hunting. There are certain uh, cultural protocols you have to go through in order to hunt in a good way, according to Anishinaabe tradition. And so when we're not practicing these food ways, we're not practicing our culture. We're not um, using the language to describe things that only the Ojibwe Moan language can describe accurately. So um, in summary, I just wanted to share some of the major research teachings. Historical and intergenerational trauma have impacted indigenous communities very greatly, and especially when it comes to our food ways, boarding schools, uh, loss of land, even genocide, removal, all of these have stopped that generational transfer of knowledge, of food knowledge, um, to the next generation so that, unfortunately, um, only a few um, people at Red Lake practice these traditional foods. I also covered the Hoofed Clan story. Our relationships with our more than human relatives are really important. It's important that we have reciprocal relationships with them and continue to stay true to our values as Anishinaabe people um, of being generous and not wasteful. And then our foodways um, and their significance. They're really important to maintaining relationships with our more than human kin. They're really important as part of that intergenerational knowledge transfer between elders and the future generations. The people strongly believe that when we're practicing our food ways, um, we are healthier and we feel better. One of my interviewer, interviewees said that um, 
it actually just, you know, berry picking just brings her joy and happiness. So it's even um, good for our mental health. These foodways are significant to our culture and our language, as well as to maintaining our natural resources in a good and healthy way. So um, I think right now we're going to have time for questions and answers. Uh, thanks, Ashley. By the way, that was awesome. Um, can you, do you have the ability to go back to yes. the, uh, I'm thinking the slide with the, the, the rock writing, the pict pictograph panel on the top left? Mm hmm I'm wondering uh, if dogs are uh, a part of Anishinaabe traditional culture and especially um, hunting dogs. The reason I'm asking is because of that, uh, that image there. I'm wondering if there's a, a relationship, traditional, like, you know, deep-rooted relationship between Anishinaabe and dogs. Yeah, so actually, <laughs> as part of our ceremonial life way, um, dogs ha are consumed as part of some of our ceremonies. Um, as far as helping with hunting, I don't know. Um, this is a pictograph that was that is from the Boundary Waters, which is an area in northern Minnesota um, that's part of our traditional territory. And there's a lot of pictographs um, in this area on these boulders, um, and so it depicts a man or a person, I think, a moose. Um, and I, yeah, I'm not sure if that's a dog. It could uh, be, but it also kind of reminds me of a beaver or a marten. Um, interestingly, while learning more about uh, the Anishinaabe for this, this research, um, I learned that we used to send messages on um, birch bark scroll, birch bark. And um, so, for example, a family might be at a camp and they might want to explain to people that were going to come in after them what they did and who was there. So on these birch bark, um, we would write um, or we would depict people and um, these people would often ha be depicted by their clan symbol. Um, and so people would know who was there based on the clan makeup of what was written on the birch bark. Um, so I did introduce my clan earlier. Um, clan membership is really important to traditional Anishinaabe society. So I'm Eagle Clan. Um, traditionally, Eagle Clan members were uh, leaders in the community um, and responsible for knowing our history and taking on leadership roles. Um, and at Red Lake, there are seven major clan clans, but across Ojibwe communities, there's more than that. Thank you, Ashley. That was awesome. I really enjoyed it. I'm wondering if, um, in the conduct of your research, uh, did the, uh, not, I'm going to say it wrong, Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe. Uh, community, in, in what ways has that community then been able to take your research and your, your, um, the things that you learned and perhaps bring them, bring the younger generations into an understanding of those ways? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, there are quite a few foodway revitalization programs in Red Lake. Um, one is get an get a ganaki, I'm not saying that right, but um, it's our traditional gardening program. So um, we have a community garden that tribal members work in, um, but there's a lot of other programs that um, are part of that. So one is that they will build garden boxes for elders, um, raised ones so that they don't have to bend over on the ground um, and so that they can continue to garden as mobility comes a bigger issue for them. Um, another program that we have is for the youth and it's a hunting camp where they get to learn about hunting but through uh, Anishinaabe leaders. So they get to learn all of the cultural protocols that go along with hunting and um, the proper ceremonies for that. Um, there's a push 
to um, actually introduce a lot of these food ways to the community. Um, and so I'm like, even though they're not practiced to the extent that they once were, it's really good to see that the community is taking this very seriously and establishing things like this to get um, the future generations involved. Um, there's a youth camp as well in the summer where they do things like go identify plants and pick berries. Um, and so, yeah, the, the community at Red Lake is um, actively practicing these and trying to teach the wider community about them. Hi, Ashley. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was fantastic. So I was wondering, I understand that uh, with your interviews with the elders, then that was a part of your research process, but it seems like receiving information uh, orally from elders is a common thing throughout a lot of different uh, cultures. And so I'm wondering, what was the methodology that you went about getting this information? Is there like a certain uh, set aside time for elders to share this information with youth? I noticed that that was one of the things that you had in one of your diagrams, that that's an important part of preserving your culture. And I was wondering just what that looks like. Yeah, so interviews are uh, not the same as visiting elders in a traditional sense. Like it's very, I've been, um, one time I was at a, in a, museum fellowship program and we had a couple elders that were traveling and visiting these different areas around Minnesota with us. And I'm an avid note taker. So I was there like scribbling away as the elder was taking or was talking. Um, and he emphasized that if I was writing, I wasn't truly listening and that I needed to pay attention. So, um, you know, the oral tradition, you know, traditionally is you're listening, you're not um, asking questions or directing the conversation like I was. So the interview process was kind of a hybrid process in terms of combining the oral tradition, but with anthropological methods. So I um, had an audio recorder and then I had a backup recorder on my phone. I had a list of questions um, that I asked the elders and they, I use those as a guide, but um, I let them take the conversation where they wanted to take it. Um, it didn't feel right necessarily trying to guide them <laughs> in certain directions just after, you know, knowing that um, they, they're the true leaders in that situation and that I needed to listen. And I learned um, a lot more than just about food by doing that. Um, learned a lot of cool family and personal stories that they shared with me. Um, I typed up that interview transcript the following year. I shared it with them. I shared the audio recordings with them. Um, and then they are included um, in, at the end of my uh, master's report as transcripts. So, so yeah, it's, it's not the same as um, uh, like going and listening to elders or being in like a ceremonial context when you're just listening, but um, it's, it's the best I could do <laughs> for the, the requirements of the thesis. And um, Sonia Adelaide, I mentioned her earlier, she's an, an Ojibwe archeologist as well. She has a resource called, um, I believe braiding knowledge. And she talks about how to braid traditional knowledge in with the more um, Western methods of uh, knowledge transfer. So like interviewing, for example. Um, but yeah, if you're curious, there's a lot of resources I could give you um, that I use to um, guide that process for me. Hi, uh, thank you so much for your time. So, um as someone who was working very like closely with kids as an educator in the past, it was brought up to me that uh, similar to kind of like the amount of students in a college, there's less oftentimes than 1% representation for uh, indigenous peoples in children's books. Um, I guess I was curious, uh, have you found yourself partnering by any chance with any other tribes to also help promote uh, like food wellness and uh, independence? Um, with their youth? Yeah. Um, so 
Indigenous food sovereignty is kind of a hot topic right now in native country. So there's a lot of different tribes across Turtle Island that are revitalizing their food ways and trying to get the younger generation to practice them. Um, and so although I haven't been very directly tied to other communities doing this work um, in this process, I did a lot of reading <laughs> on other community projects and research done around food sovereignty and traditional food ways. Um, and so it's a very timely issue, I guess. And um, a lot of uh, communities across Turtle Island are practicing these um, and trying to get the future generations involved. Um, you bring up an interesting point about like children's literature. Um, I know that like back when I was a kid, I hardly read any books authored by indigenous people, but I'm really happy to see so many more resources out there nowadays. Um, there's a lot of indigenous writers and authors. And so I think you just have to do a little bit of research, but at least more currently, I'm seeing a lot um, of literature for children and young adult um, being published. And one that I would um, like to recommend is, oh shoot, I'm gonna forget, Angeline Boley. She's an Ojibwe author and um, she just had a best-selling, her first novel, her debut novel was a best-selling novel on the New York Times best-selling list. Um, and she just had this other, her second novel just released called Warrior Girl Unearthed. And I think if you're interested in archeology span and repatriation, um, the audience would be very interested in that book. Um, because it deals with the young protagonist trying to um, get one of her ancestors returned or repatriated to her community. Um, so highly recommend that um, young adult author. Um, but yeah, just there's more and um, I am happy to provide more resources if you'd like later on. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I, I grew up in the land of the, uh, the Chippewa in northern Wisconsin. And when I still go back, they're selling wild rice at, on the roadsides. And um, I've bought some, and I'm afraid to, <laughs> I'm afraid to tackle it. Mm. Were you, did you learn anything? Like, how, how did people traditionally, because uh, it's so different than Uncle Ben's. Yes. <laughs> no. Yeah, exactly. So the Uncle Ben's wild rice, for example, is genetically modified. So it looks different, it tastes different, it feels different. But when you actually buy from people that are harvesting monomen, um, it it's different. So, um, but it's you shouldn't be scared <laughs> of it. Um, it's pretty easy. Um, one of my favorite recipes to to make is um, like a breakfast cereal. So, you just boil the wild rice. You don't want it to be too mushy, but you also don't want it to be hard, so you're, you're checking it. It takes a while um, if you're boil, boiling it on the stovetop. Um, so, you know, check after 20 minutes, then maybe like 30 minutes if it's not quite done. Um, then I like to add nuts and berries to it, and it's a really delicious and nutritious um, breakfast. But there's a lot of um, ways to prepare wild rice. You can also, like, um, prepare it like popcorn where it pops. Um, so you get really hot oil and um, put it in like a strainer on top of the oil and it will start to pop. And I've had it served like that with cinnamon and sugar. And that's a really nice treat too. Um, wild rice, chicken wild rice soup is another amazing recipe. Wild rice hot dish is like, you can incorporate it into all sorts of casseroles. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of options. Um, and I actually have a, a recipe book authored by an Ojibwe woman um, that has a ton of different wild rice recipes in it. So um, I could look that up and see who authored it. Um, but yeah. Well, thank you so much. I just want to share and show appreciation for Ashley. Thank you very much for your presentation. Mm -hmm.
We have a few uh, questions from our online audience. Ashley, if you'd be willing to take a few more. Yes. Okay. Did any of your interviewees mention throwing wild rice seeds back into the lakes during harvesting in order to ensure crops next year rather than over harvesting? Yes, they did. Um, so that's a practice I've heard of is um, taking some or putting some of the wild rice back into the lakes um, to try to in, um, encourage it to like grow again. Um, and then, yeah, part of the practice of not just wild rice, but any foodways is you only take as much as you need. Um, and so people would talk about that in their interviews as well. Um, like for example, if you get to a berry patch, don't take all of the berries from that berry patch. The other um, animal relatives and humans, um, you know, also rely on those foods and can use them too, so. Thank you. Um, you mentioned eggs in your talk. Uh, what kinds of eggs are harvested? Yeah, so I heard stories of people harvesting different types of bird eggs, duck eggs, and as well as turtle eggs. Um, I had a photo of a tur painted turtle on one of my slides. So we actually traditionally, I don't really know people that eat turtle today, but that was one of our foods, um, both the turtle and the turtle eggs themselves. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And another question, um, <clears throat> are there Anishinaabe traditional technologies that are accompanying this revitalization of foodways? Um, I think they're specifically looking at fiber, leather, bone, shell, stone tools, and such things. Yeah, um, so there's a lot of traditional technology involved in these foodways. So um, I mentioned birch bark a few times. Um, Birch bark is a really important resource for the Anishinaabe people. Um, this is a picture of a birch bark canoe. Um, and so we also um, use birch bark for creating baskets and pots. Um, interestingly, you can boil water in a birch bark basket and um, the basket won't burn, for example. Um, and so there are a lot of, and those birch bark baskets were also um, before we started using uh, introduced like metal uh, pots, for example, we would hang birch bark um, on the maple trees after we tap them and the birch bark baskets would collect the maple syrup. Um, and so there's an interesting, and I go more into this in my thesis, but um, there's this idea of um, survivance where um, even though our technologies might have changed with the introduction of like metal um, and other things and rifles or you know things to go hunting with, um, the underlying cultural practices and values associated with the foodways have remained. Um, and so I think that is a really interesting part of this research project. Um, and some people still practice our traditional technology and create things um, like the birch bark canoes. Um, and so it's, it's one of those traditions that um, isn't practiced by everyone, but um, some people are still practicing. And so this is a picture of um, our former chairman, Buck Jordan. He is watering the canoe. So um, the birch bark, if it's not submerged in water, um, it will actually dry out and crack. And so you have to take care of the technology. Um, and so he said, I think it was like every couple of days he'd go out there with the hose <laughs> outside of the tribal college and just like hose it down to make sure that it was um, kept intact. Great, thank you so much. Well, I think that that is um, it for our questions. And we are so grateful that everyone came out tonight and everyone in person and online. And thank you so much, Ashley, for this wonderful presentation. So thank you all and have a great evening. Thank you.